So I know that one of Barb's hopes in inviting us all is that we would draw from each other, and I can't tell you how beneficial today has been for me. So if this feels like I've echoed everything that we've already talked about today, it's as if you've written my slides for me. So I'm going home a happy camper knowing that other people think the same way I do. So um, for 10 years, I practiced at a large university setting in Western New York where we were the only show in town. So if you needed genetic services, you came to me. You saw me in the prenatal clinic, you saw me in the pediatric clinic, you saw me craniofacial team, you saw me cancer. And then two years ago, I had this wild idea that I was going to leave a place that nobody ever left. And I'm sort of glad I didn't know what I was getting into because I would have run the other way. I am the sole genetics provider at an incredibly large radiology clinic. Now, when I start to tell you numbers, um, it will blow your mind, um, the number of people who are in line to see me. Um, and so as we've talked today, I think a couple of things have been helpful. The first thing where Colleen said, who needs my face and who needs my brain? That's something that is just on my mind every single moment. And when Lori said, well, do they need the genetic counselor or can some other technology, you know, sort of take over? So I may not have a ton of research to present, but I would love to have you tell me what research questions you have. Because after two years in this position, we have now gotten past the stage of, I'm just Dory and surviving. I'm swimming through my patients every day. And now I have the go ahead to say, we've got enough control that we're gonna start researching these hundreds of thousands of patients a year. So anybody wants to collaborate and come where it's cold, let me know. So we see the slide all the time, but what I'm thinking about when I see this is when I was practicing in a university setting, there was already some triaging happening. The primary care physician, the GYN, whomever thought they were a good candidate. You plop me in the middle of a radiology clinic where everybody is just their general population, there's not a lot of triaging happening. And so that's where the role of the genetic counselor has come into place, is that many people don't wanna go into that big bad university setting for their genetic counseling. They wanted to bring the genetic counseling to the patient, but it's created a huge numbers problem. So I work at Elizabeth Wendy Breast Care, which since 1975 has been this internationally recognized radiology center. Um, it, is the largest freestanding breast imaging center in um, New York State, definitely, um, and in the US. We see 200,000 patients a year, like a fine oiled machine, it's shocking, um, come in for their yearly mammograms, their yearly ultrasounds, and their yearly MRIs. Now, if I'm being incredibly honest, the reason that a radiologist said a genetic counselor is a good idea is the downstream revenue of an MRI right within their building. So let's just get that right out there, that that, that was an important part of them. Um, so they're classified as a breast imaging center of excellence, and there are seven bosses who decide what I'm going to do and what patients I'm going to see. We have four campuses in and around Rochester. I am housed at the main campus where we offer the following services, digital mammography, 3D digital mammography, ultrasound, MRI, biopsies on site, bone density, my favorite massage, and then me, cancer risk assessment and genetic counseling. So today, generally, I just wanted to kind of say what are the benefits and limitations of being in that setting. Um, it often blows my mind how many people have really never heard of genetics. I sit there and I kind of cock my head and go, no one's ever brought this up to you before. And then to just sort of say what are the beginning statistics? What have we seen within the first two years of implementation of this program? And then I would love, honest to goodness, to make my gray hair go away. What are some ways that we could change the method and the protocol? Can I use that iPad? Head, that video, that patient portal, something that doesn't require my face and my brain because I can't do it. And when you see how few patients I'm actually seeing in comparison to the volume, hiring a lot more genetic counselors isn't the key if we're only gonna be little pieces of the puzzle. So their initial program, what they call the genetic counseling program began in 2009. It was an MRI nurse and a medical assistant who went for a little bit of training and were told, okay, we're gonna have you order genetic testing specifically. They saw less than 25 patients within the year. They did not do a great job and they still work there and they tell me they didn't do a great job of record keeping, even knowing what they were talking about. If they got a positive, they sent them over to me at Strong where I did the counseling. So they were just sort of haphazardly doing it. In 2011, they hired a genetic counselor 
who bumped the program up to about 200 patients per year. Now, when I give you numbers in a minute, you'll see how that's still very, very small. But what they did is at check-in, when the patient walked in and filled out their health history form, they took a little bit of family history, and if that person was identified as quote-unquote high risk, they could see the genetic counselor. So it was based on a point system. I can't get my brain back around how this was the best tool that they came up with, but they did a point system where if you had two or more risk factors, you were generated as high risk and you got a high risk letter. The point system looked like this. One point if you had any family member with ovarian cancer, one point if you had a personal history of breast cancer after the age of 50, two points if you were personally diagnosed before 50, and if you were Ashkenazi Jewish, you got one point. You can see there are so many holes with this in so many different ways. What if there's a personal history of ovarian cancer? You're completely missed but they were attempting and they were trying. Um, the counselor that created the system left after a year and lo and behold, this position opened and I came in not knowing what a big deal this was going to be. So in 2012, I started as the director of this program, no staff. I answered my own phone, I made my own appointments, I did all of those sorts of things and very quickly went, hmm, this is bigger than that. So genetic counselor led. Expected to see nearly 1,000 patients a year, which is about 20 a week, which isn't terrible in the grand scheme of things, except it's only a drop in the bucket. So all patients continued to be actively screened at check-in. We just started to do a better job of identifying who needed me. And I'll show you pictures or um, the rubric in a minute. But the end of their session, and this is the primary thing that I wanna talk about, it's a very passive aggressive. The, the assistant tells you your mammogram for today was normal, and oh, by the way, you answered some questions that tell us you're high risk. If you want to, here's the card for Jessica. Here's her phone number, call her if you'd like to make an appointment. And that stemmed a lot from a huge pushback from the primary care physicians and GYNs. Who are you to tell us that our patients are high risk? They had a lot of issue with this, but the office decided we're gonna identify you as high risk. We're gonna tell your primary care physician and GYN that we identified you as high risk. This is the better implementation, but it's still a work in progress. It's literally just lifting NCCN guidelines. And if a patient answers yes to any of those questions, even one of them, they are deemed as high risk. Now this is the blow your mind part of it. Daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. The number of patients that come through the building daily is 500 per day for a mammogram. It goes all the way up to 120,000 a year for mammogram. The second column is the number of those that are flagged as high risk and get my phone number. 30,000 patients a year. 30,000 patients a year. Right now we have about a 25% flagged as high risk. That's too broad, so we're working to make that smaller. But right now, the way we fish the pond to call people high risk, it's 25% of patients. If I'm only counseling five to eight patients a day, which is still up to 1,200 a year, I'm only affecting 5% or seeing 5% of the patients who call me, less than 1% of the patients in the building who are called high risk. So I sat with my radiologist recently and I said, well, even if we hired 20 more counselors, we're still only gonna see less than 20% of the patients. We don't have an effective way in this system to capture all of those individuals. I'm probably gonna go off my slides separate from what I described last night, simply because we've had such interesting conversation. But here's the idea, 25% of patients are identified as high risk. It's way too many. Right now the criteria is too broad, but it also may not be capturing all of the right people, affected versus unaffected affected patients, um, and less than 10% of the patients are calling the Genetic Counseling and Cancer Risk Assessment Office. I wanna pause for a minute and say we were kinda of talking about cancer risk assessment versus testing. My experience is the exact opposite. I am there for the purpose of a risk assessment, of a tyrocusic, who needs a management change to go get an MRI. For my office, the testing is very secondary, um, and I actually like that very much because they're coming for a risk assessment where the testing is really you know, the sub-conversation that's happening. Um, why aren't more people calling us? And that's where I wrote Jillian's little slide down of, is it because they're unaware, unengaged, or are they actively saying no? And that's something that I've been trying to put words to, so thank you for doing that. There's a huge percentage of people who aren't calling and aren't coming in, and why? And I'll talk to what we've tried to do to up those efforts. Um, 
So why aren't they calling? What are the barriers? I've had more than one patient say to me, they handed me a piece of paper, told me everything was normal, and I never even really read that I was high risk because it's just somebody handing them a piece of paper. So in our office, we've done training for the actual medical assistant who's handing the paper, that if you spend 30 seconds and have a conversation, more than one patient said, I threw my gum in it and put it in my purse. I mean, they weren't actually reading it. And some people, because they get it yearly, every single time they come for an appointment, said, oh, you really meant it after you gave me the third one of those. So they're calling years after the fact, not right at the beginning. And then should we actually be more proactive? This is what I've spent the last six months talking about. Instead of just a piece of paper, should we do something where we're on the floor and at the time of their mammogram go down and offer a conversation? You know, today you had this high risk category identified. If you're interested, we could talk to you about it while you're here. We have a beautiful center where patients are there for three hours. They're drinking tea and watching TV and doing all sorts of things as they're waiting for their results. There's lots of pockets of time where myself or somebody trained could do consent, could talk to them, could do the tyrocusic um, during that time frame. We are entertaining the idea of um, a waiting room with a monitor that has a little video of me talking, five, 10 minutes of conversation. Um, a iPad, you know, bought for the waiting rooms where they can work their way through a tutorial. So we're, we're talking, but we don't have an answer yet because 30,000 people have my phone number. Um, so we entered this idea of what I decided was essentially um, group counseling, but I called it something else. So I called it a monthly community lecture. At the bottom of that high risk lecture or high risk letter, instead of call Jess and make an appointment, hey, the next monthly meeting is at this time. So it says, for additional information, please consider attending one of these upcoming community lectures where our counselor is going to talk to you about this. These have been raving successes. We wanted to, just for intimacy and conversation, and I'm one person in a waiting room kind of having this conversation, keep it to about 25 to 30 people each time. We've been averaging 50 per time, and my secretary stay. We close down our entire lobby on a Monday evening once a month. Patients sign up. They don't pay anything, but they sign up just so that we have some accountability. When they get there, they check in. I lecture for 30 to 40 minutes on services, what it is. What I was hoping to do was to weed out people that were getting the high risk letter that didn't necessarily need me. Instead, what it's attracting is the people who need me the most and we're afraid to make that appointment. So we've just started surveying those patients. I don't have anything to tell you about it yet, but we've sent out surveys to each of them sort of saying what was helpful, why didn't you come to counseling beforehand, what made you think that this was a better, you know, at atmosphere, that kind of thing. And at the end, there's my staff, my secretaries, my assistants with intakes willing to schedule people, willing to take a family history, willing to do this, the risk assessment or the tyrocusic on the spot. Um, and sadly, more than 95% of those people then make an appointment. So it's not doing what I hoped it was going to do at all. Um, but I feel like they're better educated when they come in. Interestingly, and this is where I'm going off the slides for a minute, I wrote myself some notes throughout today. My time with each patient has gone down since I started the community lecture and since we've gone to panels. We have this very thing, very fancy thing called a dashboard where we have to keep track of 500 people in a day. So literally they're moved throughout um, a screen telling you where they are in the bathroom. They go to the bathroom if they're changing, if they're doing this, wherever they're going. Well, it tells how long they're in a room with me. So when I go to a waiting room and grab them, I move them on the dashboard and say in with a genetic counselor. So I have to the second how long I'm spending with individuals where it was closer to an hour before now it's that 35, 40 minute mark. Um, so we're seeing my time frame come down because they've had some education ahead of time, um, which has been really interesting. So again, if I'm thinking through in a nutshell, 25% of our patients are high risk, less than 10% are actually calling me of that 25%. And should I be reaching out? This is where I've likened myself to Dory. I don't have time to reach out to the individuals. And the way I've sort of solidified it for myself is that, that starfish analogy, right? That I've sort of made a difference to that one and made a difference to that one. I don't know how many more people we can fit within our protocol. Um, a couple of our doctors have started thinking through, do they need to have me up front? Do you need to have me as a beginning part of the conversation and the consenting? or is there ability to have other individuals? So one of the things that we've come up with with the help of some project managers and things is this idea of a future workflow where while they're there, 
and they're gowned and they're waiting for their mammogram results or something through that process, could somebody approach them at that point in person instead of the piece of paper? And what would that do to our uptake rates and those kinds of things? So this is just one idea. Um, from 2011 to 2013, 96,389 health history forms were completed. 24,000 were identified as high risk and 1,088 of them were actually seen. So we're only getting about 4% of our patient population um, seen. In those 1,088 genetic counseling visits, 80% of them pursue genetic testing. And this is a highly motivated, highly educated, they came in knowing there's very few people that are actually gonna take the time to call me to make an appointment if they're not going to test. Most of the time, that 20% that didn't test, I see large amounts of families together. We have a easily four hour geographic radius that come to our center. So it's often moms, daughters, sisters, group counseling. So even though it's 1,088 visits, that's build visits, lots of other people would have been present and part of the counseling. Um, 664 were negative. Those are the people I wanna talk about for a minute because if I take those 664 of them, go to the bottom here, 464 of them were still eligible for MRI. And that was the point of putting me within the genetic care or within the um, radiology center was there are so many of our patients who still need to go on and get screening. So we were able to track of those 464, how many went downstairs and actually had an MRI at that six month mark. At that very first MRI, six months after seeing me, 54 of them had breast biopsies and 14 cancers were diagnosed right then at that very first visit. To the radiologist, that's so incredibly important because if they hadn't had that intervening um, appointment with me, would they have gone on for an MRI? The other way that we thought about it is we did a retrospective review of two years worth of charts of those 26,104 patients who were classified as high risk. 2,149 of them came for counseling, which was up to that 8%. They can track that to when I came on board and the volume went up, so we had a little bit higher reach rate, if you will. But what I am so interested in is why did 92% of them not do a thing? And going back to Jillian's idea, they didn't know about it, they didn't pay attention, or it was an active, I don't want this service. For some of the individuals, we're not actively capturing that they were seen elsewhere. They could have gone to Strong, had the testing, and just never reported it on that health history form, and that's happened quite a bit. Um, and so we reviewed so far about 1,800 charts of people who did not see me, did not make any contact with genetics at all. We're just trying to read into what's happening with them, and we matched them to people who had seen me. So we've got 1,800 and 1,800. There were 194 cancer diagnoses, about 10% within that first two years. So they got a point that was, your diet, you are high risk, didn't see me, and in those two years were diagnosed with cancer. So we're trying to create something where we can interview some of those patients about what was it. Um, ultimately, what was interesting is how many of them had received the high risk letter one time versus two times versus three times. There were patients that kept getting that information over and over and over again. Um, and then really interestingly, and I'll stop here because I'm over my time, we started to look at the pathology of it, what percentage were invasive versus what grades they were against other patients within our building as well. And so patients who had sought genetic counseling and had an MRI had earlier diagnoses, obviously, than patients who hadn't gone and had that MRI in between. So my real question is, how do I keep up with this many people um, using technology to my benefit because they're not going to get my face and my brain and my mind, all of them. Tired? Good. <laughs> Any questions for me you can think of? Oh, come on. Um, so being from the same area, I kind of understand the patient population you're dealing with and the, the catchment area is huge for yep. Rochester. Um, do you get a lot of phone calls that you end up sending people to other places because they are too far away? That's why I knew where you away? worked is when you said Syracuse, I said I know who you work for, yes. So um, we get, a lot of it has to do with insurance. We have a very odd insurance 
seen in Rochester. Um, and Excellus is one of those providers that makes it very difficult for us to test an unaffected patient when their affected family member is alive. Not just did you appropriately counsel this person, but we must show documentation of estrangement or refused testing or insurance didn't cover for that affected relative. Um, and so we go to a lot of lengths to connect whole families, which is why they get referred to you as we're trying to figure that stuff out. Yeah. Sorry if I missed this, but for the, I think it was 464 who needed an MRI, how many of them went for the MRI? I saw the biopsy, but. 464, I don't know if I have the number right this minute. It was 300 and something, some 300 the majority. and something. Mm -hmm. wow. Because we have a tracking system with sort of a reminder that says this was recommended to you, and then they check in about a month in advance if they haven't booked that MRI yeah. yet with a, just a friendly call of you should you know, be booking this if you haven't. But I mean, that's a great example of what we've been talking about all day, which is a health behavior outcome based on genetic counseling. Right. Especially for the subgroup of people who did not need a genetic test or did not have genetic testing. Like, you could just publish that and that would right. be extremely useful. Right. And we have an electronic medical record and a patient portal. So every health history form for the last 20 years is part of it. We have how they're reporting their family histories, what appointments they've been doing, you know, the timing of those. So we have all of that information. It's just how to troll it and get it and make sense of it. So I have a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. <laughs> No, I was just going to ask, because you made the comment that you got a lot of pushback from the referring providers mm -hmm. about putting that high risk. Do you think that that has anything to do with some of the people not following up? Absolutely. If the person that's referring them Absolutely. is saying, well, maybe that's not really important for you? Absolutely, because one of the things, we have two copies of the letter, one that's in physician speak and one that is patient specific. And we will often get a phone call from the patient because the patient can opt out. If they don't want to be called high risk or be con to, to continue to get that high risk letter, they can call our office and say, please don't put me in that pool or notify me of my risk anymore. And one of the things we ask is why, and they will say, my physician does not think I'm a candidate. And at that point, it's a conversation with a secretary, right, of them saying, my. Yes. In the last few months, we've started this program called a Lunch and Learn, where I go into the OBGYN's office and just at lunchtime walk through and talk through why we're referring, what we're doing. We do a lot of cases with them. I'll go through cases from their own practice. Here's how, when they came, us ordering this, this is what happened, and we have all that data by um, referring physician. So Rob Resta did a, a blog post about the uh, Angelina Jolie effect, and I was, <laughs> I, I was wondering if that um, it clearly it didn't break you, but my <laughs> no. goodness. Uh, I did not the work the day that Angelina Jolie's story came out. I was at home folding laundry and thought, darn, the sexiest day to be a genetic counselor, and I'm not at work. <laughs> and my research question is, um, whether it's for you or for the group, I, I, w if you were going to recontact those individuals who were diagnosed to sort out what may have led them to not pursue the services, this is where the line of, if you're conducting research and what kind of mm -hmm. approval does that need versus you're just doing sort of a quality assurance for your employer? I, I, I would love some clarification about that. And I just want to add one little asterisk to that, which is we have a huge cohort of people who had integrated BRAC analysis only, and now there's a panel, and our discussion is how many of those people do I recontact and say there's more testing, do you want to come in? And that's created a big issue for us right now. And Matt, I feel like somebody should address your question a little bit. You know, and, I, I, you, and you should, you should definitely, if you're having questions that are IRB related, talk to your IRB in your in your hospital. But generally speaking, so if you wanna, if you wanna do something for quality improvement and you're not planning to publish it and you don't implant, intend for it to be generalizable, you don't have to go through an IRB. But if you think that the knowledge is generalizable, you think you could do this and other people could learn from it, and you want to publish it, the IRB usually wants to see it. So that's sort of at least that's how the Hopkins IRB makes the distinction between research and not research. But, but. but practically, health systems, especially learning health systems, are doing an enormous amount of quality improvement research that they're publishing now. So yeah. Hopkins, I think, is a holdout. A lot of learning health systems are just, they just do it. 